not a day goes by that uh, there isn't talk about uh, productivity, innovation and so on. It's, uh, features in all the government statements, in uh, financial review, in company reports and in uh, the general media. But I like to talk about return on payroll because it's a little more specific and a little bit more measurable. It means of course the same thing. Uh, one of the biggest uh, investments that any company has is the, the monthly payroll. Uh, I mostly talk to CEOs of uh, Fortune 500 companies or Australian blue chips that have maybe a thousand or more employees. So you can see that the, uh, the investment, the monthly payroll, is pretty big. Now the issue is, what's the return on payroll? Because the CEOs are, they're really the, uh, the, the um, caretakers of the return to shareholders. So total shareholder return must include return on payroll. Now, um, there's basically two ways you can get a, a better return on payroll. You can go out and buy more expensive people, uh, or you can uh, keep the people you've got and make them much more productive. And how do you do that inexpensively uh, and with an immediate measurable result, or a fairly short term, say one quarter uh, measurable result? And the method we use is to make them much better thinkers. Most uh, business thinkers, most people on the payroll who are paid thinkers, uh, what are they paid for? Well, they're paid to come to work every day and their output is decisions. Um, uh, some decisions uh, make a buck for the company, some decisions cost a buck. And the problem, of course, is not making decisions at all. So when we talk at uh, return on payroll, we're concerned about how can we make uh, more decisions and better decisions. And there's the best way to do that, the most inexpensive way and the most direct way is to increase the quality of the thinking of the paid thinkers. Um, very little has been done about that. Most people are using 2,500 year old brain software, Greco-Roman logic, which uh, is largely about defending the rightness of a point of view. So you go to a business meeting, what do you do? You see people sitting around the table defending their viewpoints. You look at the parliament, we see the Westminster, uh, Westminster Westminster system. People on this side are saying, I'm right, you're wrong. People, no, 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 I'm right, you're wrong. And this takes up all the time. And what we hope will come from that is a, uh, a safer and a more productive future. Well, it's a problem. The electors of Australia are not happy with this. They see it as a problem and shareholders see it as a problem in the business context. So what we need to do is upgrade the thinking software of the people in the enterprise. And one of the ways we do that is with X10 thinking. Um, there's a scientific base for it, but X10 thinking is a very powerful concept in mathematics, powers of 10, escaping from where you are by powers of 10. And uh, in X10 thinking, we use uh, X10, uh, multiplying things by 10, as a way of escaping from points of view to find much better, 10 times better, points of view. Um, one uh, company I worked with in the 80s was uh, General Electric at a time, this was the mid 80s, uh, General, uh, Jack Welch had just become the new chairman and I designed a program for GE called GEX10. What have we multiplied GE by 10? In those days, uh, GE was a $35 billion manufacturer. Uh, as, as today, manufacturing was under, under the weather. Um, Jack Welch liked the idea and we, we put it across the, the whole enterprise. We didn't have the internet in those days, so I used to travel around with a with a uh, 20 or 30 uh, slide projector system that was uh, back, back screened and we'd go to conferences all around the GE world, did about 40 conferences over a uh, two or three year period uh, where we would teach the X10 thinking to the executives, uh, people on the shop floor, middle management, executives and board level. Um, and Jack became uh, uh, famous for his uh, uh, adopting the concept of X10 thinking, escaping from our point of view, he invented a new word called boundarylessness, which uh, uh, became famous for GE culture. Over the period of time that he was uh, GE, uh, GE chairman, he grew the company from $35 billion to over $300 billion. It was a huge return on shareholder uh, investment, and it became at that time the most valuable company in the history of the world. Uh, in recent years, if we fast forward uh, 10, 20 years, this became uh, a growing management uh, uh, philosophy in America. And then you have young CEOs like Larry Page of Google, who uh, took up the whole concept of uh, GE uh, thinking. There was a wired cover story last April. Um, 
where he said he lives by the gospel of X10 thinking. Uh, you may know that uh, in Google now it's so entrenched in the corporate culture that by law at Google you can only do your job four days a week uh, and on the fifth day one whole day is devoted to X10 thinking or what they also call moonshot thinking after the Kennedy idea of uh, we're going to get to the moon within ten years. Um, uh, now this is not just an interesting quaint you know, a little piece of California innovation. This is how they grew the concept of AdWords, which is the biggest money engine in, since the Industrial Revolution, and Google Maps and other things. And of course, today, Google is the most valuable company in the history of the world. So X10 thinking, let's not just talk about productivity and innovation, important, but they're just exhortations. What we need is technologies. Technologies um, give us a toolkit for doing innovation and productivity, and X10 thinking is one that can be uh, implemented uh, across the enterprise within a business quarter, and then you go from a cost center to a profit center, return on payroll um, uh, by the second quarter. So productivity plus innovation equals return on payroll.